Today on Dr. Phil. No, no. Parents struggling with mentally ill children. No, you never do. The treatment hasn't solved the problem. The pressure can be overwhelming. I have cut it. You cannot do this to us. This problem is so much bigger than we are. These girls have labeled themselves in a burdensome and negative way. Get out of here. See how millions of families can manage mental illness. Have a good show, everybody. Here we go. I know things are tough out there, but we can do this. If it matters to you, that's what I want to talk about. Ten seconds to end. Love you. Well, thank you. This is going to be a changing day yeah. in your life. Ready, camera five. Three, take track. Go, Dr. Phil. Let's do it. to do today, but there are some things I want to talk about before we kind of get to what we're going to spend most of the day doing. You know, actress Marsha Cross from Desperate Housewives did it at age 45. Political wife Elizabeth Edwards did it at the age of 48, again at 50. When men do it, sometimes in their 80s, it hardly gets noticed. <laughs> Who knows what I'm talking about? Having kids really late in life. Recently, one of the world's oldest moms, Maria Carmen del du Busada, I think is how you pronounce it. She's from Spain, del Busada, died of cancer, leaving her two and a half year old twins motherless. She's very sorry about that. She was 66 when she gave birth. Now, her argument was that her mother lived to be 101. Now, the world's oldest mother is an Amkari Panwar from India, and she wanted a male heir for their family. So at age 70, she used IVF and had twins, a boy and a girl. She needed a boy because in that country, for your wealth to pass on, it has to go to a male heir. So they wanted to do that. What do you think about parents having kids that old? Does that bother you all? I mean, does it? What do, you, what do you think? You're raising your hand. Stand up. As a mother and as a psychologist, I think it's very important for us to celebrate the rights of older women. They are mature, they're wise, they're resourceful. In fact, older women were responsible for the rearing in part of two of our presidents, Obama and Clinton. And so they are more than Is capable. Is that a good thing? They or? are more no, than sure. capable. <laughs> Of Just raising kidding. wonderful children. And I think it's a slippery slope when we start saying which women are capable of being mothers. If we throw older women under the bus this week, next week it'll be poor women. The week after that it'll be immigrants. The week after that it'll be if you have an obese mother or a woman who smokes or curses. So all women should have the right not to have us judging their wombs. Okay, well, I, I get it about you talking about the mother's rights, and I'm not sure I even disagree with that at all. I haven't told y'all what I think yet. Uh, and I may not, the way you're talking. <laughs> no, no, stand up, stand up. You started this. Yes, absolutely. Let's go. <laughs> no. But what about the kids' rights? Absolutely. I mean, what about the kids' absolutely. rights? Because here you've, got, here you've got a mother that was 66, and now these children grow up motherless. Absolutely. They, they grow, because she wanted to have kids, which makes her feel good, and she celebrates that, and everybody says, isn't that great? But what about the kids growing up without their mom? I'm so glad you asked. Those women, those children have a right to live. And those children are going to grow up by, surrounded by their family and by their community. And so if you ask those children a couple years from now, do you wish your mother had been banned from the opportunity to have you? Or are you glad that you're on the planet? I'm sure they would celebrate their lives. And so for the children, I believe the children should have, look at those children. Will we say that those children, look at them, Dr. Phil. When yes, we say, yes, <laughs> I'm looking at when we say those children shouldn't have a right to live, those children are going to be great one day, and I celebrate them. Okay, but... <laughs> Don't clap for yourself. Thank you. <laughs> I'm celebrating for the women and for the children. Okay, but what, are you just saying that it doesn't even matter whether the mother's in the picture? You said, oh, says she died, but there's a community that's going to raise them. It's not the community's job. I think that if we believe that women who are older should not have children, then we need to say men over 50 need to have vasectomies. Say that again. If we, 
and so appreciated in the beginning, you said that no one makes an argument or a fuss when older men, men all over on and off Viagra, are having children, and then they die, and there's no controversy and no okay, show. Okay, what do you guys, are you Kathy? I'm Kathy. Stand up. What do you think? And you're Angela? Yes. Stand up. I'm going to have two of you to fight her. <laughs> All right, so you guys are, are, you don't think it's a good idea for I, mothers that old to have I children? I say no, and only because I was relatively young. When I had my children, I have two grandchildren now, um, and I don't know that this lady, had she survived, would have had the energy to raise these kids. And, and when they get into high school, all the challenges that parents face, whether your children are perfect little angels, there's high school and middle school challenges, and there's such a huge age difference that, you know, I don't know. I, you know, now I, I agree with you. These children do not have their mom. Okay, Angela, it bothers you as well. Oh, yeah. I, I have a year and a half year old, and it's hard enough for us to take care of her, and I'm 28. I couldn't imagine trying to do it at 66. And I think it's just very selfish. And, and that's two. She had two. <laughs> yeah. And, you, you know, you have, like, So you don't think it's selfish yeah. for the mother to do yeah. it? Yeah. She died of cancer. There are women who die of cancer at 20, at 30, at 40. And so... Well, true, true, true. I think, it's, I think it's unfair to call her selfish. I think that's unfair. We see a behavior, but from a behavior, we can't determine what someone's motivation is. I just think that really this is two separate issues. One has to do with reproductive technologies, and that's really coming on strong in the last 20 years. The other one that you're bringing up is older mothers. And I think that older mothers do a great job. They're more stable in their relationships a lot of times. They have um, a lot of extended family that's older and able to help them. Um, it's just a good situation. I work with a lot of older mothers and because um, I'm in higher ed and I think it's just they're great they're great parents. Yeah, they, they have the experience. They bring they something have a life else experience. to the yes. game that maybe a young mother exactly. doesn't have. I think you raise good points here and, and I'll tell you what I think and it, it doesn't really, it, my, my opinion doesn't have any more weight than anybody else's but I've really been thinking about this and I had so many responses uh, on my blog about this. Number one, I absolutely, definitely do not think we should pass laws about when people should have babies or when they shouldn't have babies. I am, listen, I am, I am so concerned about that slippery slope you mentioned that if we start passing laws about what we can do with our bodies, that is really scary. But I'm also concerned that sometimes technology can outstrip morality. I know that there was a time not too many years ago when we didn't have the technology to save some people that had been horribly burned or horribly injured and because infection would get them. We now have the technology to keep some of these people alive and I'm just not sure that it's really being alive. I'm not sure that sometimes that technology doesn't give us the ability to do things that don't make common sense or even human sense. Uh, so when you go to extraordinary lengths to create this, I, I think we have to think about that. I just think we have to think about that. But I am not, I will never be comfortable with telling somebody what they can or can't do with their body. I would just hope that people, I would just hope that people would really stop and think not just about what they want, but about the impact on the child. You know, do we have the resources? Do we have family if something happens to me? to really think ahead so the child is not left on their own. I really appreciate y'all thinking about this. Go to drphil.com, go to the message boards, tell me what you think about this. I wanna hear from everybody here. Go to the blog, tell me what you think. There's a post up there about how old is too old, so I'd love to hear from all of y'all. Okay, now we gotta move on. Next, I, I want you to listen to this. Now this, this is audio only, take, take a listen. <laughs> All right, so just how old do you think this child is? Three, four, maybe five years old? We're talking about tantrums here in this situation. The tantrums got so bad that her parents sent her away for three years. Now, you're going to be shocked to see how old she really is. Plus, are you in over your heads? Now, what I mean by that is there is a point in every situation where parents are in too deep. The challenge of something a child is pre presenting goes beyond their skill sets, and they have to have some kind of outside help in some way. 
Are you in that situation? Would you recognize it if you were? We're going to talk about all that when we come back. <laughs> Is there a point at which the children can present something in their behavior, their personality, their physiology that actually puts the parents in over their heads? I get this question so much from parents because sometimes parents say, Dr. Phil, I'm out of options. I don't know what else to do. My child is getting bigger. They're getting stronger. They're getting more difficult to deal with. I don't have the resources for this, but yet I know it's my job, so what do I do? How, how do I move on? Uh, this is where Jennifer and Brad have found themselves. Uh, they have three daughters, two of which have been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, as well as other behavioral issues. Now, their youngest is the only one that they think kind of functions within the mainstream, functions within the the, the kind of normal range, not that there, there aren't problems with any child, but within a normal manageable range. Now, before the commercial break, you heard a child uh, with a tantrum. Now, that was Jennifer and Brad's oldest daughter. Uh, she's not three or four or five. Uh, she's 13 and has had tantrums sometimes six a day. Now, there are a couple of tantrums that the parents captured with their home video camera. So let's take a look to get an idea of, of where we are in this. You don't care. You do care. I don't care. You all right? No. Never all right. Never all right. Nobody cares. We care that you would like. No, you don't. Yeah. You never care. Nobody cares. 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 Nobody is going to solve something? Yes! What is it going to solve? Everything! Stop! Yes! No! Stop! No! So that's your life? That is our life. That has yes. been our life for years. And are you in over your head? Absolutely. Absolutely. So you, so you recognize that this is not something that you have the resources to manage on a day-to-day -day basis. Do you concur with that? Oh, yeah. yeah I mean, it's, it's incredibly difficult, as you can see there. And, and then that's post a lot of treatment, too. She's been through years of treatment. We've been in, you know, she started therapy when she was six years old. She's been on medication since she was six years old. She was sent to, she's been in two different residential treatment centers, and nothing has changed. But obviously, then, the treatment hasn't solved the problem. No, not at all. That doesn't mean it hasn't helped at times, that it hasn't gotten better at times than others. And you consider her to be bipolar. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you understand that that is a controversial diagnosis. Yes. That there are a lot of professionals out there, experts out there, in, in, including the writers of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual right. for the American Psychiatric Association, that don't consider pediatric bipolar disorder to be something that's genuine. Right. And, and there are those out there that say this has really been pushed by the pharmaceutical companies who want this to become a reality so they have something to match to it. 
On the other hand, there are very uh, legitimate researchers and those that are working on trying to discern what happens with children with this behavior at this age that feel that bipolar, even a fast cycling bipolar, right. is, is very real for kids this age and younger. Right. Uh, where do you come down on the controversy? Do you think you have an accurate diagnosis of what's going on here? I think after all these years, we do. We've seen several different psychiatrists through the years, and they've all danced around several different uh, diagnoses, and they've all come back to bipolar. And as one of the doctors put it, uh, the stabilizer that she is on, in, in a normal person, that stabilizer would bring them to a point of being zombie-like. And with her, it it brings it down. Her moods are down somewhat, but she is by no means okay, a zombie. And what is she on now? She's on uh, Depakote and on Seroquel Abilify. and Abilify, yes. You, you have another daughter, Ailish? Yes. Okay, tell me about Ailish. Ailish is bipolar. She was first diagnosed as having generalized anxiety and obsessive compulsive disorder. And when we tried to treat the anxiety after the first dose, she had a manic episode. She was five years old in dress up clothes, riding her bike in the middle of the street at three o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And she was completely incoherent and she stayed up for four days straight. And right. uh, so from there we went to a bipolar diagnosis and Okay, and she has actually shown some violent tendencies, Very. chasing she, you with a knife, and you have a younger daughter as well that we've she mentioned. She absolutely hates my younger daughter, Kieran. Uh, Kieran is healthy. Kieran is generally a happy child, so Ailish really hates her for that, yeah. and she wishes that she wouldn't exist. Now, this is the doll that has been cleaned up, uh, since, but we have a still of this doll that Ailish got uh, very aggressive with and began to show some uh, some serious signs of... Yeah. She asked for an American Girl doll for Christmas and uh, right. she we thought that she wanted a brown hair, brown eyed doll uh, because that looks like her. her. Right. And she said, no, I want a blonde, blue-eyed doll, which is what our youngest, Kieran, is like. And so we said, okay, we got that for her, and then she cut her hair. And we thought it was destructive, but we didn't realize she was trying to cut her hair to look like Kieran. And, um, and we found this doll in the middle of her room, and it was buried. It was like it was in a coffin, and um, she had put baby K on there. Um, and when... We saw it, Kieran was with us and screamed and ran out of the room. And she was, I mean, just chills on my, I, I was just so stunned. And um, Ailish came in and she said, what's wrong? I was just playing doll. I was just playing hospital with the doll. Very sing song and it was just one of the most chilling things I have ever experienced. You cleaned the doll up and gave it back to her. Why did you do that? We cleaned it up and she went back to treatment very soon after that and we had put the doll away. Um, and when she came home, she wanted to know where it was and so we just put it back in her room and you know, I don't even think that she's played with it once. I don't know why she wanted it back. We just kind of, um, there are some battles that we fight and there are some battles that we say, okay, if this will make things and, and we cleaned it up right, immediately afterward, mostly for Kieran's benefit. You know, but, but yeah, it, it was frightening to her, and so frightening to her. It, She's saying that, she absolutely. was saying this is me. Absolutely, I mean, absolutely. We all we all felt that. Let me introduce you to Dr. Frank Lawless. Um, Dr. Lawless is uh, a psychologist. He is the chairman of the advisory board here at the Dr. Phil Show. We have the children back in the green room. With your permission, I would like for Frank to go back and meet the girls and Absolutely. chat with them a bit yeah, and fine. maybe see how they respond to some relaxation type things, get an idea. Because one thing we know is that both of these girls are genius level yeah. intelligent. And mm -hmm. I don't, when I say that, I don't mean that in a casual sense. No, I mean, not at all. they've been tested intellectually and their, their intellectual levels are extremely high. Yes. Uh, which is good and bad. <laughs> there's, there's good sides and bad sides. It is a very double-edged sword. Uh, to that. So we're going to take a break. Dr. Lawless is going to go back and meet the girls. Uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about what the parents can 
should and shouldn't do when your kids are struggling with behavioral issues. I want to talk about the trial and error uh, that this very dedicated mother and father have been through in hopes that it might help you understand some of the challenges that you may face uh, at home. These are dedicated parents, but there aren't easy answers to these things. We'll be right back. How do you think that being mentally ill changes your life? I think it makes people look at me differently. Kind of like either I'm like handicapped or that they think that I might like strike out any moment. I think people are scared of me. to do what she's supposed to. Right. I mean, this is, the, this is a situation where I don't see, I see her using her illness as a, as a method to just get out of doing the chores. I have it. I have it. I can't fight like this every day. I'm so furious with you right now, Brian. I am so furious. You cannot do this to us. This is really unfair to everybody and to your sisters. You are you know? so mean to your whole family because you're selfish and don't want to do your chore. I have had it. Let's just be real straight up honest about this. If I was going to prescribe what I would want a mother to do with a child, uh, yelling at her would not be on the list. Shaming her about what she had or hadn't do would not be on the list. Guilt-inducing her about how she was impacting the rest of the family would not be on the list. Now, so therefore, you would think that I'm going to turn around and tell this mother she's dropping the ball. Let's talk about the reality here. This is a multi-year march with a child. And this is the whole point that I'm trying to get across here. There comes a point where your coping skills, your resources, your ability to be mom in a, in a cool and, and straightforward manner is just depleted. And so today we're talking about parents uh, who can get in over their heads and what do you do when that's the case? Now, uh, Jennifer and Brad sent two of their three young daughters to treatment for behavioral problems. Now, they've been gone pretty much uh, for the past three years. Now, the two girls returned home a few months ago. Uh, Jennifer sent us some home video uh, that she made on her own talking to her 12-year-old uh, daughter, Ailish. Now, take a look at what they talk about, and then we'll talk about what y'all talked about. How do you think that being mentally ill changes your life? I think it makes people look at me differently. Kind of like either I'm like handicapped or that they think that I might like strike out any moment. You think they think you're stupid sometimes? No. That's good. I can prove them wrong. Think people are scared of you? No. I mean, maybe some people. I don't know. You think they feel sorry for you? Maybe. You think there's people who don't want to be your friend because you have mental illness? Yeah. And how does that make you feel? It just makes me feel mad at them because they're being so judgmental. Like they just see the illness? Yes. Not you? Mm-hmm. Obviously, this is a calm moment right. with a very intelligent uh, young girl. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I'm very concerned about is that both of these girls have labeled themselves. Right. And, you know, there's a concept called iatrogenic labeling. And it, it's a situation where the label creates more problems than the circumstance it describes. Right. There have been longitudinal studies done with kids back in the day when they would write into their medical record borderline mental retardation and put them through school, they'd take the same kid with the same IQ and write in their record uh, gifted right. and send them through the system. They had two very different trips right. because the label had such a burden to it. And these girls have labeled themselves in a burdensome and negative way. Right. We've tried to give them tools to be able to understand why am I taking this medication, why is this happening, things like that, because they are so smart. I feel like we have to be 
a little bit more honest with them about what's going on and, and why things are happening and and <clears throat> especially residential i mean how do you tell your child you're going away you know and i had to explain to them this problem is so much bigger than we are and it's because <clears throat> you have issues and we need to work through them it is not because you're a bad because that's what they used to say i'm a bad girl i hate myself i'm a bad girl because they couldn't yeah. control their actions and so we had to kind of put it over on this it's not you know to separate the two you know I love you your illness is a whole different subject you know and, yeah, that's... and you could and, and you can make an argument for that but I, I'm just telling you yeah, objectively yeah. from my standpoint it is apparent to me that this label has been detrimental to these girls they they interpret that in such a way that they kind of demonize themselves. They kind of put themselves in a, in, a, in a very negative light, whereas an enlightened conversation among adults or professionals could say, you know, mental illness is like a, a, a gallbladder problem right. or so you don't need to have right. shame and guilt with it. But because of the way others react to them right. and because of the label that's been put on, I fear that they will live to the label. Right. We do try to make them understand that, you know, this is, like Jen said, it's, you you have other gifts and focus on those and use those to get past whatever detriment you may be suffering from this from this illness because we know you know like I said they're they're incredibly bright and we think that they have potential for you know a great future and we want to make sure that they we've helped them understand that don't let that just be an anchor to drag you down you need to work hard and work past it but for every negative that they get, you know, I've said before, it takes a thousand attaboys right. Right. Exactly. To, to kind exactly. of offset that. And if they get a lot of criticism, a lot right. of conflict because of their tantrums, they're labeled as mentally right. ill, then those tremendous gifts, right. which they clearly have, right. can kind of get lost in the background. And I, I don't know what the proper diagnosis is for these girls. Right. What I do know is that there's a huge cognitive element here right? because they're at genius level intelligence but they're processing at a much lower level which means there's a lot of interference in there right. whether yeah. it's anxiety or you know, whatever it may be right. and that's what we have to try to sort out at one point brad and jennifer and their youngest were actually sleeping behind locked doors uh living in fear with the two oldest because of the lack of predictability so when we come back we're going to talk about how this affects them and the rest of the family. Because let me tell you, if the parents don't take care of themselves, they can't take care of the children. You, you can't give away what you don't have. So if you become emotionally bankrupt, if you become emotionally burned out, if you just get to the end of your rope, you've got nothing left to, left to give. You've got to take care of mom and dad along the way, too. We'll be right back. Mental illness changes you and how a life is for you. I think it changes me in the way I act, the way I think, the way I everything. It changes my life because first I had to move away for three years, second I had to come back, which is really hard. How does it feel to be home again? Surreal. I don't feel like it's really happening. It's just so weird. <laughs> I also feel at the same time like I've been home forever, but I don't know. Are you afraid to go, that you'll go back to residential? Yes, definitely. Well, we're talking with Brad and Jennifer. Uh, they made the decision to take their two oldest daughters out of the home and put them into a treatment facility. Uh, you just saw Ailish, the middle child, interviewing Brenna, uh, the oldest. What happens to the rest of the family? What happens to mom and dad? Uh, what happens to the youngest? Jennifer sent us some home videos. Take a look uh, at what Kieran has to say about all this. What does it feel like to have two sisters who are mentally ill? You can feel bad because, you know, you don't really know what it would be like to just have a normal sibling. How does it make you feel when they get angry or, or upset and they have a meltdown? Well, when one of them has a meltdown, it pulls the other one into having a meltdown and that puts them into a fight and then I just feel alone. 
Are you scared? Yeah. What are you scared of? My sisters. What? That they're going to hurt me. So what do y'all do now? We don't know. I mean, at this point, Ailish is pretty stable, but with, with this, it can change any day. You wake up every day and just hope that it's going to be a good one. With Brenna, it's, we're, we're very concerned because we don't know what we're going to do at this point. Well, I, I want to be sure that, and, and listen, I am the least informed about this situation involved. You guys are more informed about it than I am. The people that have been involved in the diagnosis and the treatment are more informed about the history of this situation. And I come in with a fresh perspective to add something. I want to be clear on what it is. I am very concerned with the labeling of these right. girls as mentally ill. And, and I feel like I am contradicting myself when I say that, but as adults, I can sit here and say we should not judge people with mental illness, we should not react to it with shame and guilt as though it's something, oh, don't say that. I, that's my adult conversation. But my conversation with children, I recognize that they can, I mean, mental illness to them quickly becomes crazy, wacko, right. weird, mm -hmm. and then they get judged by other people, and then they start living to the label. We know they're extremely intelligent, but yet they don't process at that level. They don't learn and retain at that level, which tells me, as, as someone that is focused so much on, on brain functioning and emotion, that there's something going on there that maybe could be dealt with. Because if you get these girls functioning at the level right. they can, they'll figure this out before you do. Right, right. Because they're probably the smartest people in the family. You know, there's, well, there is. There's this Absolutely. intellectual drift where kids are smarter than their parents. Right. Right. And these are brilliant kids. We, we've got to find a way to harness that and turn it around. Well, we've got to take a break. Dr. Lawless has been working with uh, the girls in the green room backstage, talking to them, chatting with them. When we come back, we're going to see what his reactions are to, uh, to these girls. We'll be right back. taking a break from the stage and I'm about to go into the green room and meet Brad and Jennifer's three daughters. Hey guys. Hi. How are y'all? Good. You must be Brenna. Yes. And you must be Ailish. Yes. And you must be Kieran. Yes. So how you doing? Uh, we're good. Hi. We're good. So Dr. Lawless, what have you been doing with these pretty girls? Well, first of all, we've been basically talking about how they feel and and you know how they go through their life and um, we used the M wave and all of them did really great uh, they all got into the green which means that they got their brain relaxed they got the heart relaxed and uh, and so I'm, I'm real proud of them. do you think uh, he, he's been kind of working with you guys on how to to calm yourself and relax a little bit do you think that's something that you can do yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I've been talking with your parents and um, you know they they love you girls just amazingly is that something that you feel every day I mean do you feel loved in your home do you feel comfortable where you are with my parents yes not always with my sisters but yeah do you think it would help if you three got along better yeah probably a yeah why do you say that Ailish why do you think it would help less stress Less stress. For everybody. Yeah. Because half of my stress is coming from my relationship with them. Yeah. Where's the other half come from? School, just regular everyday problems, anxiety. Yeah. What do you think? Same. Half from my sisters. Yeah. Half stress. Do you all have fun together sometimes? Sometimes. Rarely. Rarely, Rarely, but like two of us will be playing together and one of us will be in our room. I've seen pictures of you when you were at the beach. Uh, That's this year. one of those times. It was one of the times awkward, that you had fun. Yes. Or we'll play school or something in the house. Well, guys, I wanted to meet y'all and just tell you I've been visiting with your parents and I, I've been looking at uh, a lot of your history and what you've done and I, I just think that all three of you girls are just 
completely delightful. Uh, you're smart and alert, and then you got so much going for you that I just hope things really go well for you. And I just wanted to tell you that. Thank you. Thank okay. You. All right. We'll talk to you soon. Uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about you know really what all the are what are the alternatives right now, and uh, how do we make this next uh, year coming up a, a really good year for this deserving family. We'll be right back. <laughs> How does it feel to be the parent of two mentally ill children? I feel sad. I feel guilty. I feel responsible. I feel like I should be able to fix it. And I can't fix this no matter what I do. Things that we wish we could fix and we just can't. And so we have to learn to deal with those. And it's very frustrating as a parent to see your child hurt or ill and not be able to help them. Nobody has answers that are concrete, that they say, take this pill, do this, you'll be better. It's very hard. It's the hardest thing I've ever had to, to do in my life. Well, Brad and Jennifer have struggled with their two oldest daughters' behavior um, really since birth and just kind of escalating uh, on. Uh, they constantly um, deal with this because it's it, it just you know it'll get better for a bit but it's ever present um i want to talk to dr lawless in a minute but i, I know i sound like a broken record um, about this but it, it is I, I i feel so passionate about this i i just fear that you guys in the chronicity of this thing uh, and, as you said, Brad, in, in, the, in the reality of having to have the labels in order to trigger the resources from the social agencies and all to get the help that you want, that you've gotten so used to and comfortable with this labeling system of mentally ill that I think it can become fatalistic for these kids, I, I would love for them to be labeling s themselves as, as in, in intelligent and gifted in so many ways. Not to deny that they have behavioral issues, right. but I, I, I see in their symbol system, I see in their construct system, that they have labeled themselves in such a negative way. And I think as long as that prevails, this will, th this will never change. Dr. Lawless. Um, what, what do you think of these girls? You, you, you saw that they immediately were able to do some self-soothing, right? Well, that was very remarkable because uh, many people take uh, an hour or two to learn how to use these particular devices that I was showing them uh, to, to relax themselves. And they did it in five or ten minutes. Uh, and with, there's a little light on the, on the device itself that goes from red to blue to green and red is not relaxed, and, you know, blue is in the middle and, and green is very well. They kept that light in the green all the way through. When we finish the show backstage, I'm going to ask you to visit with Dr. Lawless about some questions that you may want to follow up on and ask because there are some things that I didn't see anywhere in the medical records about toxicity of the brain and some of the cognitive evaluations that could be done to create some treatment programs that Dr. Lawless has said he would be more than happy to meet with the resources up there, institute some things to see if, if we can do some things to embrace the intellectual skills for both of those girls uh, at this point. So wonderful. think about what we've said and you can meet with Dr. Lawless when we talk about that backstage. Thank you. We'll be right back. We're going to be checking in on Brad and Jennifer to see how this family is doing. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Dr. Lawless. He's author of Retraining the Brain, uh, which is a really important book. If you've got a gap going on between intellectual capacity and functioning, I mean, sometimes your brain can get in the way of itself. Uh, it has to do with stress and anxiety and getting out of a toxic brain situation. So. 
Um, Frank, thanks for writing this book. I know it was a lot of work for you, and thanks for agreeing to meet with them backstage and, and also with the resources available up north. So uh, for more information on how to know if you're in a situation where you're in over your head with your children, uh, go to our website, drphil.com. If that's the case, if you're in over your head where you need other resources, it's beyond your skill set, the sooner you acknowledge that, the better off you are because then you can start reaching out for that help and resource that's there. So go to drphil.com. We're going to have some things there to kind of walk you through that decision-making process. It's been a very important conversation today. Thank you all for sharing uh, about, your, about your family. Um, and, and thanks for being examples of such devoted parents. You've made some very, very difficult decisions. As you said, I didn't agree with all the language that's being used in it, but take that for what it is, and we'll go from there. Thanks so much for being here. So, uh,